And in the 25 years I've been studying central banking and, and competitive alternatives, there's never been as much public attention on the Fed as there is right now, and there's never been such critical attention. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV from Las Vegas' Freedom Fest. Right now we're talking to Steve Horwitz, an economist at St. Lawrence University in upstate New York and an associate of the Mercatus Center at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. Steve, thanks for talking to oh, us. My pleasure, Nick. Thanks for having me. You are known as one of the pit bulls online of Austrian <laughs> economics, uh, a uh, school of economic thought that often gets either ignored completely or pilloried when it is paid attention to. Why is Austrian economics on, uh, on the rise, uh, that it's at least being attacked more? Yeah, I think there's a couple reasons. I think one, libertarianism in general is on the rise. You can see from you know, a couple thousand people here and, and the kind of attention that, that, we're, that libertarianism in general has been getting in the last few years. And so Austrian economics associated with that in a variety of ways, I think gets the attention. But I think the, the other reason is, is that the Austrians actually have an explanation of where we've been the last give 10 us, years. Give us a quick thumbnail of what Austrian economics is and how it is really uh, you know, counter to both uh, you know, a, a monetarist school, say, which most people are probably familiar with, or a Keynesian model. Well, if we think in terms of macroeconomics, I, I think the big key is that for for Austrians, Austrians are less concerned about uh, sort of economic aggregates than both the monetarists and the Keynesians are. For Austrians, the key to m what we think of as macroeconomics is understanding the way in which money affects individual prices and interest rates and thereby distorts the coordination of economic activities. Right. right? So, so for example, in the last few years, we saw the Fed uh, engage in expansion of the money supply, driving interest rates down low, generating the boom right. of the 2000s, and then leading to the bust that we've seen more recently. When people uh, take issue with Austrian economics, they typically say, look, these are people we've never heard of, so they can't be important. Or that, you know, they're talking about a world in which uh, people would compete over currency use. I mean, there would be no monopoly on money. This is all pie in the sky. Why is Austrian economics relevant in a world of central banks and of government fiat money? Well, I think because they've screwed up so massively. I mean, what we've seen is the Fed both cause this crisis and then uh, expand its powers enormously in the last few years and be unable to, to resolve it. And so I think we've, in, in the 25 years I've been studying central banking and, and competitive alternatives, there's never been as much public attention on the Fed as there is right now, and there's never been such critical attention. Basically what you're saying is there isn't enough money that the Fed could pump into the monetary supply to actually change what's wrong with the economy. Well, that's right, and we've seen it. I mean, we've seen the Fed expand almost triple the monetary base in the last few years, and the banks are just sitting on it. One reason is the Fed's paying interest on reserves, but another reason is the banks don't think the lending opportunities are out there. Right. So it's, it's, to use the old expression, it's pushing on a string. You know? So, and I mean, this is something that I find very interesting is that, uh, you know, free market critics of Keynesian stimulus I, uh, theory will say, you know, Keynesians are always going to say, oh, just make it twice as big, three times as big, four times as big, there's something similar on the monetarist side, right? right? Where they say, you know, if the economy hasn't restarted, it's because we haven't pumped enough money in. How do you get out of that epistemological, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, pat yeah. on the back? Yeah, it's, and, it's, and in some sense, it's unfalsifiable, right? Yeah. I mean, there's just, we, it's all counterfactuals, one way or the other. And I think what Austrians and others need to do is to be, tell the best story we can about why we think that's not going to happen and why what, what some of the long-run unintended consequences of that might be. I mean, you want to empower the Fed to do those things, you give it a whole bunch of new powers that you know it's just not going to give up when the crisis well, is What, uh, from an Austrian point of view, if, I mean, if, let's say Austrians get in charge of the Fed, obviously the first thing they do is disband it. Yep. What's the second thing they do? I mean, realistically, <laughs> What is the policy prescription that emanates from an Austrian perspective? I, I think right? for, with respect to monetary policy, at least anyway. Yeah, I mean, you got to close the Fed. you got to re-legalize the public use of gold or other commodities as money. You have to also get rid of some old laws that prevent banks from issuing their own notes and redeem, make those redeemable in gold. So there's two problems. you got to end the monopoly that the Fed has, but you also have to create the conditions for competition among banks to produce a, a more stable currency. Let's switch gears. You write a lot about the family. Yep. Talk a little bit about your work on that. Well, uh, because, and you know, libertarianism uh, writ large is often seen as anti-family yep. or indifferent to family units as opposed to individuals. So. Well, I think there's a couple of things that, that I've been doing in my work. One is to sort of document historically the way in which capitalism and industrialization produced what we think of as the modern family and that this poses an interesting dilemma for people on the left and the right, right? That on the left, 
who love the sort of uh, scope for choice that people now have over the kinds of families they, they create and what they do with them, I want to argue that it was capitalism that made that possible, but both through opening up economic freedom, but the wealth it created too. And conversely on the right. And if I can yeah. also interrupt, I mean, uh, Mises talks about this at various yeah. points, that the contractual That's marriage right. is essentially part of the liberal project exactly. uh, as opposed to That's right. something else. And it was, it was when marriage became contractual, that was empowering of women in a way had never been the case before, exactly. And of course on the right, right, folks who at least pay lip service to capitalism and the dynamism of the economy, but don't like the cultural change that it generates, right? And so for them, they, you know, but what my response to them is you can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. Once you've unleashed the, 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 the dynamism of the marketplace, you're going to get dynamic cultural you say, change. Well, you know, and this is uh, people on the right, uh, people like Charles Murray, you know, self-defined libertarian says, you know what, we have an unsustainable family issue here where so many people are being born out of wedlock. You know, it's screwed, and you, you see the cognates of that on the left as well. Is that all capitalism's fault? There's two things going at once. You have the sort of long-run secular forces of increase in wealth that have made single parenthood possible, but you certainly have damaging policies, and especially the tax code and other sorts of things that have made it uh, more p worth people's while not to marry. And one of the things I'm trying to argue in this work is that marriage and family are still important. We just need to be more open and more flexible about how we about how we define those things. This is something that often gets leveled against libertarians. Uh, it's you know it's relativism run amok. I mean, is there something wrong? with a single parent family. There's not. I mean, what, what, what I think is clear from the research is that all of the things equal, two parents who, you know, who, who are taking care of a child is better than the alternatives. But when everything else is equal and a dysfunctional two-parent family is not as good as a functional single-parent family, or we can make the same argument about same-sex couples versus versus heterosexual. Well, this leads into another project that you're involved in, the group of uh, self, uh, self-defined group, Bleeding Heart Libertarians. Yeah. And libertarians are often seen as incredibly austere people, again, who don't care about groups or you know social welfare except for me uh, talk about Bleeding, Hearts Liber Bleeding Heart Libertarians. What's its ethos and what are you trying to accomplish? I think there's two things going on at once there. One, at the philosophical level, is an attempt by many to sort of blend Hayek and Rawls, for lack of a better term, which is to say... And we're how, talking about Lou Rawls, the uh, yeah, Lou, yes, singer, yes, we, yeah, yes, we want to see more yeah. Hayekians into, into okay. the blues, yeah. into rhythm and blues. Yeah, but John Rawls, but the, the John Rawls philosopher. philosopher yes, yeah, yeah. yeah I, think the, I think the idea there simply is to say that, you know, Rawls' argument was that social institutions are justified by the extent to they work, that they work to the benefit of the least well-off in society. And I think the construction that from, from many of the, uh, those philosophically oriented is to how, how might libertarianism meet those, that, those criteria? Does, can we justify, morally justify libertarianism on the grounds that it actually does do better off, but better by the least well-off than other systems would? No, I, I mean, isn't that just self-evidently false? It, it, <laughs> no, and, and I'm, I'm taking yeah. the, the point of view of a critic who would say, no, we know that because we know when Ron Paul says in a Republican Party debate or a presidential debate, yeah, if a guy doesn't have health insurance, nobody should have to treat him. So you would, you know, libertarians would rather see people die in the streets than uh, help them. Right. Well, I think there's a difference between saying nobody has to treat him and then a asking the question, what has, what, you know, how much has the standard of care risen over 200 years? How much is even a poor American today able to procure medical care outside of those kinds of systems? And so looking, think of Deidre McCloskey's work here, ar arguing the way in which throughout economic history, growth and industrialization have benefited not just the wealthy, but especially the poor. And there's all kinds of interesting data on the sort of average American family today versus a generation ago or a century ago that we can look at. I think there's also on the Bleeding Heart Libertarians project, there's a more less philosophical idea, which is simply this notion that libertarians ought to be talking more about how our policies benefit the least well off and not falling into those kind of traps that Ron Paul kind of fell into there, which is to let's, let's focus our rhetoric and our language and the way we think about issues on explaining how libertarianism can, can, can address the concerns of many on the left and do so more effectively than their own policies can. What's the best place to read about Bleeding Hearts Libertarian? Bleedingheartlibertarianism.com is the blog and there's, uh, it's very active, all kinds of things going on there. All right, well, Steve Horowitz of uh, St. Lawrence University of the Mercatus Center of Bleeding Heart Libertarians, thanks for talking to Reason TV. My pleasure, Nick. Thank you. I'm Nick Gillespie.